Hi, this is Sapten Bhartia and we are here at Open Source Summit North America. I have with me Julia Lejean who is Corporate Vice President at Microsoft. We met last year at the Connect event in New York and that's what the time when Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation. Microsoft has been uh, engaged and involved with a lot of open source communities. But I just want to know how much things have changed ever since you joined the Linux Foundation. Well, I will say that our, you know, engagement and our commu- you know, and our mutual engagement has just, you know, really bring up to next level. Uh, I know there's our teams in Microsoft which is actively working on making Linux kernel, etc., once even faster, even better on Azure. And we're working on, you know, with the Linux Foundation, the various other Linux teams. Uh, when there are uh, bugs, feature set, et cetera, makes it work uh, to make the particular Linux OS implementation runs better on Azure. We're also working on helping them to speed up the engineering uh, feedback loop. So, you know, today it might take three months before those, you know, features and capabilities actually goes into Azure. We're looking to say, can we actually speed up that capability delivery? So our joint, our, you know, common customers actually benefit, you know, from, you know, those capabilities that we have been putting in. So these are the, you know, these are happening every day. And, you know, beyond Linux Foundation, we're in a bunch of other Linux related uh, foundations, whether it's a Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, et cetera. And uh, we're also heavily, you know, invest in our Kubernetes, um, you know, and other open source effort. As you mentioned, uh, the co-founder of the Kubernetes project, Brandon Burns, uh, now is a uh, key member and leader of our Azure Container Service um, work, and is really bringing the the goodness uh, of those innovations to all of our customers. And uh, we're seeing that, you know, with us joining Linux Foundation, uh, it's really our one of our one of the ways for us to state our commitment to Linux, we're also seeing like you know the percentage of Linux VMs running in Azure uh, continue to increase dramatically, and the number is well over fifty percent now. So, and so again, I think that you know, customers are betting their Linux workload on Azure, and we're seeing a mutually beneficial relationship, uh, and uh, that's really helping our customers. That's the high order bit we're looking for. That's interesting because last I remember it was something around thirty three percent. And uh, now you're telling me that it's fifty uh, percent. But with the new VMs that we see starting, it's more than fifty percent. I cover Microsoft a lot, and uh, I get a lot of pushback from the community because they still have this perception that Microsoft is a proprietary company. And yes, for a long time it has been a proprietary company. But you have been doing open source also for a very long time. However, uh, over time, you know, you have, you know, in- increased your participation and engagement with the open source community. You have also joined the Linux Foundation. So how do you how do you plan to change this perception? Yeah. So the interesting fact is that I think that I want to spend a bit of talk about reality versus mm-hmm. perception. If I look at reality, we are as you know, GitHub, much to our surprise, really listed that Microsoft has over 15,000 contributors mm-hmm. working in GitHub. Mm-hmm for open source project. And that is both Microsoft led project as well as broad set of community based project. And then we spend a lot of time talking about Kubernetes, containers, Linux, um, Node, you name it. We're actually you know, in many of these open source project contributing. And if you think about any of the popular open source workload, mm-hmm. it runs extremely, you know, we make sure, we want to make sure that it runs well on our cloud. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm having a hard time thinking of what open source technology we don't support, right. much like Google or AWS. Mm-hmm. And uh, from you know, the contributing perspective, the other key thing that we have done is that from three and a half years ago, we have made both the C Sharp and .NET open source and cross-platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is the last most popular dev platform actually went open source. But nevertheless, you know, it was open source more than three years ago. And we're seeing significant traction with .NET on Linux as well, with our customers, with the you know, with our partners with Red Hat, etc. So if you think about the sort of the open source stack that runs on Azure, the programming language that's supported by Azure, everything is every single programming language is either standard based or open source. C sharp, Java, Node, Python, you know, Go, etc. We support all of it in Azure. We support all of the open source stack, Hadoop, Spark, MongoDB, MySQL, et cetera, et cetera. And so I feel like our open source 
support is actually very complete from that perspective. So when I look at that, is say that is really the engineer reality, which I was spending a lot of time, energy, effort. And I do feel customer is starting to see that. And that's why we're seeing the increase of the VM, uh, the Linux VM count as a you know, early indicator. At the same time, we're definitely still battling the perception that you know, because we made this transition in such a rapid fashion. And you know, uh, when I think about when we open source C Sharp, which is only three and a half years ago, the world that was three and a half years ago to the world today is a dramatic change, dramatic change. Because three and a half years ago, as an engineer in Microsoft, you were not allowed to look at open source code at all without a approval from a VP. Mm -hmm. That is currently not where we are today with over 15,000 contributors in open source project. But because of how rapidly we made this shift and this pivot, I think that many customers are not quite used to this idea that Microsoft is open. Microsoft is really embracing open source with both arms and we're making significant engineering investment to make sure that we are part of community, we're contributing and we're using and we're helping customers using open source better. I think they're still getting used to this idea and it will take some customers a little bit longer to get used to that idea. But I think that the engineer reality of what we are doing very much support the narrative that we want and we will continue to be open and supporting the open source movement. What I'm talking about is that, I mean, historically Microsoft has had, uh, you know, developers have been its strength, but of it as uh, open source is becoming more and more popular, uh, maybe a lot of, you know, open source developer may have issues with some trust or transparency with Microsoft. So th that's my question, you know, how to earn the trust of these uh, open source developers. Not the open source community in general, but developers. Yeah, what I mean. the uh, developers. Yeah, they're developers. Yeah, and that's a fantastic question because obviously me as the the CVP of Microsoft Developer Tools and Services, that's a very important strategy question for me. And if you look at what we're trying to accomplish, one of the key things is that we have, Microsoft historically had very good developer assets. In particular, if you think about, you know, our one of our core product like Visual Studio and .NET, it has been very popular developer tools and platforms. But in the old days, it was only targeting and building Windows and Microsoft platforms, right? Only runs. And to what we are really doing today is that we made a significant strategy pivot as well in the last two years, where we want to say we want to take our best developer tools and service and make it sure that we're helping any developer and any development team, no matter what kind of application they're building and no matter what kind of operating system they're building their apps on, we want to be helpful and provide tools for them. And with that kind of strategy pivot, we invest things in Visual Studio for Mac. We bought Xamarin. We invest in Visual Studio Code, which is a open source cross-platform in a lightweight source code editor. And some of the very first extensions we actually put out for Visual Studio Code is actually Node and Go. It's actually the best Go editor and compiler there, you know, editor there is out there. And today, you know, with Visual Studio Code, we're seeing over 2 million monthly active users, even though we just G8 last April, so that's less than, you know, 18 months. We're seeing enormous adoption. And the thing that really makes us happy is that we recognize that developer fundamentally like good technology. So with Visual Studio Code, we're finding users from some really surprising places. We had Google, the Chrome team actually put up their own YouTube videos. They were just talking about their people were asking them very innocent questions, which is that, hey, what code editor do you guys use? And they end up showing a demo of Visual Studio Code. We're having a close conversation with Facebook because they want to internally adopt VS Code for their engineering practices. We know Uber and you know, Netflix, etc. And we find these things, not because we ask them to do it. We discover them when we go to conferences. And when they're doing a session where they're talking about their technology, they have to show code. And here comes Visual Studio Code. We're like, oh yeah, we recognize that code editor. And I think that you know, we, what we like to do is again, to speak with our actions. We want to produce great product. Developers like good product. If the product's really good, I hope that developer will you know, take a look at what we have to offer. And you know, I fundamentally, as a product engineering person, I'm like, let the product do the speaking. So and from, you know, from going back to your question, we're really trying to engage with developers by starting offer them great tools and service, which they love and they use. 
And from that, you know, hopefully we get an opportunity to introduce our platform to them that they will find useful. And we have customers tell us stories like that, where they start with the adoption of Visual Studio Code, and they were on a Mac, had never used Microsoft Tech before, and they really love the product. And the next time when they have the opportunity to go experiment with a bot, they're like, oh, maybe I should give Azure Bot Framework a try. And that turned out to be a really good you know, uh, journey for them. And now they're leading the bot team for their particular company. And it's this kind of journeys that we really love to encourage, is to really win the developer's mind share and you know, win their usage first. And after that, we can talk about other things. Excellent. Uh, that was more about external developers. Let's just talk about internal developers. You know, as you said in the early days, it was really hard for Microsoft developers to contribute to open source project. You had to go all the way to, to the VP chain. But nowadays, Microsoft is contributing to a lot of open source projects. So what I'm interested in knowing is what is the internal process, you know, for these internal developers to follow? Because uh, there can be a lot of projects which have kind of licenses, which a lot of other companies I have talked to are not comfortable with. So how do you kind of uh, ensure that you know these developers are you know contributing to these projects you know kind of without any kind of legal issues that's uh, <laughs> if i may say or you know okay in general what i want to understand is what is the process internally uh, to help these developers contribute to all these projects because you know you guys are contributing a lot these days yeah that's actually a very savvy question actually this ex this exact same quite like a kind of talking track and questions is one of the most popular, most requested, our executive briefing uh, from enterprise customers. And they are very much curious about how do we think about many of these problems as they are actually adopting open source. For us, what we have done is that, first of all, we created an internal open source program office, which is really working very closely with the entire engineer leadership team, as well as Microsoft legal, to kind of put out the best practices and you know, you processes and tools. And the, where we are at today is that if you want to look at open source software, there's really no issue. At the, same, if, at the same time, if you want to go use a piece of open source software in the product and services, depending on where you want to go use it, we actually go through a legal review and then we're continually optimizing it. So let me give you a concrete example. If you want to go use a piece of open source software for a internal service in say Bing, the bar for that is actually quite low. You know, in general, you know, if the, the software is self-contained, et cetera, there's not a whole lot of problem in using it. At the same time, if you actually want to go use a piece of open source, software, uh, open source software and it end up shipping with something like Windows or Office, then I think the liability risk, uh, the risk of, of Microsoft does have deep pocket, the risk of someone actually coming back and suing Microsoft, et cetera, you know, goes up exponentially. And so there are business risks that we look at. So we're very careful about when we can use which open source software. Now we have internal tools that actually help, you know, the different uh, teams navigate and talk about different scenarios, which one can be a very lightweight process, which scenario actually require heavier weight kind of approval process. Yeah, a lot of it depends on the particular scenarios and the corresponding business risk that comes with it. Uh, so is it like manual process or it's... Uh... No, it's automated. Okay, so it's automated. So it's basically started with you know a particular the team will actually have to go put in a request of what is the open source software they're intending to use, and then you know our legal team will go help you know put in the right you know what is the current licensing and things like that. And from that you know the tool will actually say oh if it's a if you're using it in you know you need to go have a short description about what scenario you're using it for. Mm -hmm. So many times when you look at scenario, you look at the license, you're like that's actually low risk. So it's just automatically approved. Mm -hmm. And then there's a set of scenarios which is like, that is kind of a thing that requires a, a more senior manager to actually give approval. Um, so as a example uh, for my own product, Visual Studio, the Windows IDE product we do sell, when we want to include uh, the my git, the, the git implementation, the, the core part, there's a core part of my git I think is actually GPL license. And so we had to, you know, so I had to look at it and then say, okay, what is the implication of that? But in the way we're using it and in the way that we're carrying that particular component, we're making no change, et cetera, I think the corresponding legal risk is actually lower. So that was something that I had to give approval for versus the team can just say, yeah, sure, why not? That's about the code that you are using internally. 
um, what if a Microsoft employee wants to contribute to some external project and that code will never be used in any of Microsoft products and products? So, so what is the process there? Because now you are kind of, you know, submitting patches or whatever it is uh, to some external project uh, and you are using Microsoft email ID with it. So what is the process there? Is it different or the same? For that, actually, we have almost very lightweight process. You just have, in, in those cases, the Microsoft employee generally need to go sign a contribution license for that particular project and you know if it's in the that was my second question yeah no because actually all of the big open source projects on GitHub all have contributor license right mm -hmm. so they need to go you know sign the contributor license and that's actually the one place I think that our I if I remember correctly our legal team will take a quick look to see what the contributor license actually means because as an employee of Microsoft they all have their own if they're they're not uniform they all have their own unique things and in general if you're just submitting a bug fix or things like that we rarely have any issues with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, in reality, my team does that a lot. The, in reality, the challenge we run into is that when we submit fixes, sometimes we have a hard time getting the committers of the project to spend time doing pull request reviews and actually take. Uh, we have submitted a certain project I can think of. We actually submitted um, bug fixes. It sat there for weeks. Eventually, we had to go, you know, use our connection with someone in the company to go poke them, and so for another part of the team to go take a look. So there are there why, are why this delay, uh, why the patches were not accepted. Uh, well, I think that uh, when I look at the situation, right, many of the open source, they've actually, even though everyone says there's an open source project, the real operating model is quite different. Some open source project. Think about all the big GitHub projects, think about some of them are actually completely de designed and implemented internally. When they're done, they're like, here's the release code, and you can submit, you know, you can submit requests. And the engineering team probably internally have moved on to the next version. So in those circumstances, I you know the question is that are they actually motivated? Are they actually, you know, <laughs> to spend time to work on pull requests and things like that? So we see that, so this is actually not unique to us, right? So this is something that we hear quite yeah. often. Is there any license that you're kind of, you know, picky about or you're not kind of very sensitive about it? Like I, I know a lot of uh, companies, they are very particular about, you know, when it's come to, you know, GPL version three or something like that. So, so, so is there, are there any licenses that you are not comfortable with? I, you know, I think that everything is circumstantial. I don't think there's a black and white. I cannot think of, you know, I think GPL was probably the one that raises, you know, the alarm bells a little bit more. But even then, I think that, you know, we're, there's, there are definitely circumstances we're contributing. So there is no such blanket policy that you cannot use any particular license. Uh, I got everything that I was looking for in this interview. If there is something, you know, that you think you need, you, you, we should have touched upon. So please go ahead and, you know, uh, let's talk about that. Well, I think that given, you know, uh, we were just talking about how some of these companies were doing their open source practices, right? Mm -hmm. Which is copy source. The thing that I really want to, we started that conversation a little bit last year, which is that the way we're approaching a set of open source projects that, you know, uh, whether it's .NET or TypeScript or C Sharp or Visual Studio Code, is that we not only develop in the open, which means our entire engineering team, every single check-in happens in the open, but we're actually engaging in the community on the roadmap, on the architecture, in a super active form. So that is actually, and then we have a, you know, we really think about community as an extension to our team. And then we want to make sure that when the pull request comes in, we actually have a internal kind of soft SLA in terms of how quickly we should get back to the community. And I do think that approach and that set of practices is more unique, more different for these kind of large projects, you know, like smaller projects, different. But for something like Visual Studio Code, we are seeing thousands, a couple of thousands piece of feedback and pull requests. And it's not surprising when you have 2 million monthly active users, they, they have a lot of ideas. And the team, it's a very small team we have working on it. They spend, you know, up to 40% of their time every sprint triaging issues, reviewing pull requests, having discussion, you know, with the community, and to make sure that we're fostering this active community engagement, to make sure that, you know, the community actually feel the appreciation that we do have with their engagement. In our release note, we'll actually talk about top contributor, you know, like, hey, this person contributed this particular 
cool feature. And we actually acknowledge some of the top contributions from community in our release note. And I do think this sort of practice is not as common in very large and active open source project. And that's something that we're fairly proud of because as sort of newcomers to this community, I do think that we're also bringing new thoughts and new ideas and new kind of practices to how to best run you know, the community that we do have. Microsoft is open sourcing a lot of its projects and products. Uh, I, I just uh, I want to look at it from a different perspective. Like, okay, when it was proprietary product, you know, you were still getting customer feedback, you know, but uh, to, to whatever problems they face or what improvements they want. But ever since you open sourced it, people can actually look at the code and they can actually help you provide you feedback at code level, not at a product level. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they can actually send patches or you know they can improve the code. So if you look at the traditional software development model, which was the closed source development model versus the open source development model, are there any benefits of using open source? Absolutely. We benefit significantly from community contribution. So, so. Right, right. It's it's quite obvious, but just let's be specific for a while. You know, what are the actual benefits you know that a company like Microsoft gets? Uh, well, I think that you no, know, there's a couple of different dimensions to that. One is that we absolutely love our community. That's the reason that why we're spending so much time cultivating this engagement. Uh, for Visual Studio Code, for example, we are in GitHub top ten. Uh, project with the most number of contributors, right? That's people giving us bug fixes, suggestions, you know, etc. And I think that the thing we really value is this very continuous feedback cycle that you know they're engaging us with ideas about what thing they want to go see, and they're voting on our proposals. And we have a preview channel, which is like a sort of like a nightly what we call insider channel for VS Code. So they're experimenting and they're trying out some of our latest builds. So they're giving us feedback on the implementation we have. And then you know, when we go you know, actually release, they also become product champions. So we love this engagement. At the same time, I would say is that for any popular product, when the more customers you have, the more opinions you have. That is just also true. When you, they have a lot of it, and like, I mean, have you ever seen community going at each other on difference of opinion online? And so, you know, so now you also have this very interesting problem of how do you actually and some of these things are at odds of each other. And how do you actually make people understand the rationales of your decision? Explain your decision really well. And you know, so people kind of understand why you're making these decisions, even though sometimes it feels like you might be picking sides. And that's kind of a new skill. This is not a skill that we have to have before. Because before, the decisions were made internally behind closed walls. And we can just make a decision and move on. Now we really have to think about how do we engage with developers, with overall community, so we can explain these things really clearly. And they actually understand us. And they will continue to be with us. And so these are just you know new challenges we didn't have to deal with. In the old days, when we took a sprint, we kind of have a sprint plan about what we're going to do. And when you're entirely working open, you cannot predict what kind of pull requests you're going to get any day. And so if you have a soft SLA to think about how do you actually you know, come and actually make time to go respond to the pull request, respond to the issue that might be raised, that kind of take your engineering schedule and take it into a very unpredictable kind of in a way. So we also have to come up ways to deal with that aspect. So a lot of these are not only we benefit, I think the community benefit, at the same time, I think there are a lot of new engineering challenges where traditional, any engineering team will be, um, have to think about new ways to deal with these set of challenges.